Hello, BookTube. I have a tag for you today. Uh, I was going to do it. Uh, it was made days ago. It's an original tag by Sean the Book Maniac. I was going to do it days ago, but uh, <laughs> you're going to be able to see this coming. I was sprawled and comfortable, <laughs> so I didn't bother. Uh, but it's a really good tag, and it's not only that, but it's uh, the first in what I hope is a complete set, a, a complete series. You'll uh, you'll see what I mean uh, when I finally get to it in ye old notebook here. Uh, it's the alphabet soup tag. And this is the very first one, the letter A. Uh, and Sean mentioned that he want he will probably do them all, and that he might do them regularly, and that he might not do them in order, a la Alphabet Soup, which is not, the letters are not in order. But he, of course, you have to start with A. Uh, and he, uh, it's just a bunch of, of uh, prompts, some of which are letter-related, letter-specific. And I took the trouble to have prompts. I have props here on my lap, so that you don't have to stare at my face the whole time, not exclusively. Uh, so let's see. Question number one, A is for author. A good book by an author whose first name and last name starts with A. Uh, and I think you get extra points if they both do. Uh, and I have one. It's it's good, but it's very depressing. It, it's uh, part of a subgenre of literature that is, by its nature, very depressing, and that is prison writing. And this is it's this. I Will Never See the World Again by Ahmet Altan. Uh, who was, who was uh, put in prison for the rest of his life, even though he was a best-selling and headline-grabbing and conversation-starting novelist. It, it didn't matter. That, that, those things don't matter. Uh, and uh, this doesn't come out... This is not out yet. I think this comes out in... Yeah, this comes out in October in America. Uh, but I, I read it already. I gobbled it. It's not very long. I read it. I gobbled it as soon as I got it. And it is incredibly moving. I have read a large number of these prison memoirs by contemporary authors who were thrown in prison by repressive regimes and continued to write, and uh, the prose in here is amazing. It's mostly one-sentence paragraphs. It's the author, the author, I think, wrote it clearly still in a state of shock, and I think that accounts for why a lot of times in the course of this book he seems almost to be referring to his previous life as a much a controversial and much debated and much loved author, as though it happened to someone else. Just uh, I, it's incredibly moving. I'm, I'm I hate I would hate to think that this is all that we're going to get from him. That I would hate to think that. Uh, you might remember him on this channel because uh, Europa Editions came out with Volume One of a very ambitious series of historical novels that he wrote, was writing. Will never now finish? I don't know. I don't know. I need to find out. The I need to investigate what kind of his work we're ever going to see. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, come the autumn, uh, you're going to see it reviewed everywhere, and I can recommend it, but it's there's no ray of sunlight anywhere in it. Uh, then, uh, let's see here. Question number two is, uh, A is for, well, ah, a book uh, that you read that starts with the article ah in the title, or that has that article. Uh, and I have, uh, to go from uh, the sublime to the ridiculous, I have a uh, Regency Romance. This is A Chance Encounter by Gail Buck, uh, which is a, about a young woman who is perfectly happy not to marry and a young man who is being forced to marry and, uh, <laughs> and the usual Regency complications and resolutions that come from there. Tremendously done. I, so much fun. I just had a blast reading it. Uh, uh, then, uh, let's see here. Question number three is, A is for angry, a book that pissed you off. And I have a prop for that as well, and it's this. It's The Ethics of Aristotle. This is an English language translation by J.A.K. Thompson. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether you read it in this or in the Greek. It's This is, for me, one of the urtexts of the utterly fraudulent genre of philosophy itself, which consists of really linguistically adept people, usually men, uh, interrogating is one of their favorite words to use, interrogating some ordinary, uncontroversial given in order to make a big deal out of it. Aristotle does that all throughout this book. What is the difference between right and wrong? A chimpanzee can tell the difference between right and wrong, and so can you. The only reason you are torturing it with needless language, with need with verbiage, is to sort of underscore your own depth, your own profundity. What is the nature of friendship? He, he, he goes on, I think there, there are probably a hundred pages of this piece of crap are wasted on what is the nature of friendship. You tell me. 
without knowing anything about Aristotle's ethics or any other, hopefully you have lived your life without reading any other philosophical text. You tell me. Can you tell when someone's your friend and when they're not? Okay. Oh, there you go, then. <laughs> it's just, it still annoys me even now, so we'll move on. Uh, question number four is A is for awesome. Uh, a top read of recent years. Now, Sean's answer to, the, answer to this was Emily Ruskovich's book, Idaho. I want to second that. That was It was a, a very, very good novel. A trifle overpraised by my brethren in the critical community, but still a very good novel. Uh, but I want, to, I want to suggest something else. I want to suggest nonfiction. This thing, Spearhead by Adam Makos. Uh, it's World War II history. It's Battle of the Bulge history. And it's about a company of men. Who and Makos goes through their history. That's that's them on the cover, uh, only colorized. He goes he goes through their history, document by document, interview by interview, memoir by memoir, and you think, okay, well that's been done for practically every company and brigade in all of World War II. But he then does something else. He does then does something more. He does the way he writes it. The way he writes this book is. Uh, well, the, the typical word would be novelistic. I hate using that because it, it seems to me that when people use say that a history work reads like a novel, they're insulting both history works and novels at the same time. Uh, but it, there is there. I wonder if I have an example for you here. This is this is an example of our. Yes, oh, let me read you about it first. When Clarence Smoyer is assigned to the gunner's seat in his Sherman tank. His crewmates discover that the gentle giant from Pennsylvania has a hidden talent. He's a natural-born shooter. At first, Clarence and his fellow crew in the legendary 3rd Armored Division, called Spearhead, thought their tanks were invincible. Then they met the German Panther, with a gun so murderous it could shoot through one Sherman and into the next. Soon the pattern emerged. The lead tank always gets hit. After Clarence sees his friends cut down, breaching the west wall and holding the line in the Battle of the Bulge, he and his crew are given a weapon with the power to avenge their fallen brothers, the Pershing, a state-of-the-art super tank, one of 20 in the European theater. But it comes with a harrowing new responsibility. Now they will spearhead every attack. <laughs> uh, and it, uh, Let me see if I can... Uh, the Mark Force walls closed in as Gustav shut his hatch cover. Across from him, the driver's instruments glowed in the dark confines. The tank had never felt so small. Rolf guided the driver as he backed the tank alongside the chosen building. Rolf had the driver edge the front of the tank to the right so the gun was aiming into a massive four-way intersection, while the building still shielded their position. If the Americans came hurrying down the road in a rush to reach the train station, they would drive into their ambush. There was nothing left to do but wait. How many Americans are coming? A crew member asked Rolf. Rolf said he did not know. What are our orders? Another asked. Fight them, Rolf said. Gustav couldn't believe his ears. It was as if someone had just wanted to be rid of them, and worse, Rolf wasn't resisting in the least. In every burnt, honeycomb building he came across in Cologne, Rolf must have envisioned his, brother, his beloved Dresden. During the firebombing campaign against his native city, 15 square miles have been charred, which surpassed the 10 square miles of Hamburg that had been incinerated in 1943. Between the initial British attack and the follow-up raids by American bombers, it was believed that as many as 25,000 Germans had died in Dresden. The truth was horrific enough, although Goebbels broadcast an inflated death toll of 250,000. Uh, and the the uh, you'll notice in that passage that Makos is telling you exactly what he can know and extrapolating carefully about what he can't know but is probably true. Uh, there's also, those of you who are World War II history fans will notice a jab going on in that passage, uh, because it isn't just Goebbels who thought who thought and proclaimed that 250,000 people had died in Dresden. It was also David Irving uh, in, in his huge best-selling book uh, about the, the firebombing of Dresden. But anyway, uh, I, the, I thought this was incredible, so I want to recommend it. If you see it uh, at a bookstore in your uh, World War II, especially uh, you know, an ordinance uh, type of person for World War II or a, a Battle of the Bulge fan, a fan of the final years of the war in the West, you got to get it. It's like nothing else you've ever read. Uh, let's see here. Question number five is A is for Ah, a book whose title includes at least three A's. <laughs> Believe it or not, that's harder. I found that harder than you would think. <laughs> but I eventually did find one, and it wasn't the only reason I didn't find it right away is because it wasn't where it belongs. It, it wasn't on its shelf where it usually sits. In fact, it was near my bedstand uh, because I'm using it at the moment. That's I, did, I, I totally forgot that. It's Paul Strathern, 
Uh, it's the artist, the philosopher, and the warrior. His book about uh, Niccolò Machiavelli, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and Cesare Borgia. And the reason that uh, some of you will probably be able to see this coming, the reason that I'm using it, the reason why it was set apart, uh, is because I'm working up a review of Paul Stratham's new book on the Borgias, uh, required uh, digging into his other books. Uh, let's see here. Question number six is A is for annoying, a character who drove you up the wall. Now I have that here. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of my answers, uh, the, the, in addition to the answer just being an answer to the question, there's also, uh, I try to keep A in the, in the author's name. Uh, and this is Taylor Adams. We saw this on this channel. This is his thriller, No Exit, by a young woman uh, named, uh, I jotted her name down here, Darby Thorne, uh, who comes across a lost girl at a snowbound rest stop and doesn't know what to do about that, has to figure out what to do about that, with most of the action taking place at that rest stop. And Darby Thorne is funny. And she's smart, and she's uh, she's certainly not lacking in courage. And she drove me crazy, the whole course of the book. Uh, I, I and it was it, the, with the things that she misses, with the things that she doesn't think to do, with the obvious things that are staring in the face that she doesn't even realize. And it was only once I'd finished the book, the whole time that I was reading it, I was taking notes. I was thinking, okay, well that's just ineptitude on the part of the writer. It was only when I finished the book that I realized that I was probably supposed to be annoyed with her. That was probably part of the author's plan. Very well done. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, let's see here. Uh, number seven is A is for ambivalent, a book you're still not sure what you felt, how you feel about. Now, Sean's answer was What Belongs to You by Garth Greenwell. And I, if Sean, if, if, if by some chance you're watching this video, I would really like to have one of those edited, jump-cutted video conversations with you for the edification of our viewers on whether or not you hated What Belongs to You by Garth Greenwell. I'm saying that you are not ambivalent about it, that you, in fact, hated it, and that you uh, don't want to admit that because of some sense of, co of solidarity with the gays. <laughs> I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's what's going on in your mind. Needless to say, I was furious when, when, when in his video, Sean says that he is so ambivalent about this book that he's not going to be able to figure out whether he liked it or not until he rereads it. Rereading. Think of all the great books in the last two years that he has bailed on in the first five pages, but this piece of crap he's going to reread. <laughs> Rather than just admit, it was bad. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I have an answer to that is not, uh, that is not one belongs to you. Needless to say, I was not ambivalent about what belongs to you. It's just bad. It's just a bad book. That's all. Uh, no, mine was, I have it here, uh, was uh, We the Survivors uh, by Tash Ah, uh, which is, it's the story of a struggling fish farmer named Ah Hawk. Uh, and that is a novel on its own. But it's also the story of this a, a, a complicated murder trial that he's involved in. And it struck me all throughout the book that that also is an, a story on its own and that the two don't go well together or maybe aren't meshed well together in the course of the book. Now, this, this doesn't come out until early September, so I'm going to read it again. When I get the finished copy, I'll read it again. I'm hoping it'll make more sense to me then. But right now, I'm, I'm definitely ambivalent about it. I think it might be terrific. Uh, but whether or not it's terrific will hinge entirely on whether or not I can see greater cohesion between those two stories in the course of the book. So we shall see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, eight is... Uh, a is for an Anticipation, a book you're very much looking forward to reading. Now, Sean's answer was The Last Samurai by Helen DeWitt. I thought it was funny that he, he has, has heard from various booktubers, probably myself included, that it is a great novel. Uh, I would say that without any serious competition, it is the greatest novel that's been written yet so far in the 21st century. Uh, and I thought it was, thought it was, thought it was sort of funny that, that uh, Sean has been warned by a couple of other people, Britta, I think, was one of them, uh, that he's not going to like it, and that he's going to do one of his celebrated bails. <laughs> I would, it would break me heart if he bailed on The Last Samurai. It would break me heart if anybody did. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but for me, I want to pick another A author. This is uh, David Abulafia, uh, the author of The Great Sea. He wrote a, a book about the Mediterranean called The Great Sea. And this is uh, The Boundless Sea, a much bigger book, coming out in, in November, October. This comes out in November and is The Boundless Sea, A History of the Ocean. Uh, and of the oceans of the world. And I'm greatly looking forward to it, but it's big, and if it's anything like the Great Sea, it's going to be, uh, it's going to require 
a lot of attention, a lot of note taking, a lot of concentration, and that's not the sort of thing I, that I have I leave to do at the moment. I've done it. I've made a couple of exceptions, and Eduardo Albanati's the, the Catholic School, for instance. But I've made a couple of exceptions. But I really have to keep that number down, or I won't be paying attention to the books that are right now on my horizon. Uh, but I'm looking forward to this very much so. Uh, then nine is A is for actually a book you didn't expect to like but did. Uh, Sean's answer to this was Do Not Say We Have Nothing. Uh, and mine is Ali by Jonathan Icke, his big biography of Muhammad Ali, which I'm not, I'm not a boxing fan. I think it's endlessly ridiculous. <laughs> uh, and I'm not a fan of people who are boxing fans. I can't stand the, the cult of synthetic machismo that just suffuses the boxing world. I can't stand it. I, I, and also the discipline itself, the sweet science of hitting someone's head with your knuckles. I, 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 I'm not a fan of it at all. And also, before I read Ike's book, I didn't think I was a fan of Ali. You know, the, the cult of personality, the, the, uh, the uh, cozying up to extremists, the, the uh, grandstanding and refusal to serve in the armed forces, the, the elevating of the person over the sport, over the discipline, over the fans, over the commentariat. The, the endless stream of cheated upon wives. I just, I didn't think that I could be made to like Ali at all. And, uh, and Ike's book made me love him, not just like him. It's a, a masterwork of biography. Uh, I don't have it as one of my props. My prop, my prop gathering mojo wore out. <laughs> but I do recommend it, especially to those of you who are not fans of boxing or of Muhammad Ali. You're going to love it. I can speak from personal experience about that. Uh, uh, let's see here. 10 is A is for affected. A character, book, or writer you feel is pretentious. Sean's answer to this was Call Me By Your Name by Andre Asiman. And uh, I agree completely. I don't have a separate answer. I'm perfectly happy to take that as mine. <laughs> Although I could also use What Belongs to You by Garth Greenwell, which is even more pretentious. And has less grounds to be, since it's it all of it. What Belongs to You was, was uh, air-pumped into its current page length from a novella, uh, on the, the exact same story, only in novella form. I know because I reviewed it. <laughs> I, was, I reviewed it uh, before when nobody knew who it was, when nobody knew what it was, or that Garth Greenwell's ticker tape raid down Grand, uh, down Grand Central Station Avenue would happen, or that he would be, you know, put on all the gay money, or whatever it is that he is now. Uh, before any of that, when he just had one unheralded small press novella, I reviewed it. Uh, but <laughs> even before that, You've got the you've got this hugely pretentious novel, What Belongs to You. Then you've got a slightly pretentious novella. But e even if you dig past that, you get to the incident. You know there had to be an incident. There had to be an incident where Garth Greenwell himself, not his character, but he himself, tried to pick up rough, sta rough trade in Prague and had it go south. Okay, fine. Uh, you know... And not not to get all uh, all uh, not safe for work on you, but that's happened to a number of us. <laughs> it isn't worth a five decade long Handel opera. <laughs> it's it's sort of the nature of the business. But <laughs> anyway, uh, I could, either one of those would be fine by me. Uh, then eleven is A is for how's it going? Eh, uh, which um, is a little strange because A is not for any of that. There are no A's in that. <laughs> so I don't know what that is. I don't know what the connection is there. Uh, but the prompt is a book you liked by a Canadian or one you want to read. And the minute that a Canadian writes anything good, I'll let you know. <laughs> uh, and number 12 is A is for anticlimactic. Uh, a book you thought fizzled out at the end. Uh, and to my dismay, Sean mentioned Picnic at Hanging Rock. Now... I, I understand where that mention comes from, but Picnic at Hanging... That is like saying saying that that uh, that the ending of Picnic at Hanging Rock fizzled out, or in other words, was dramatically unsatisfying, is like saying uh, that uh, the climax of Herman Melville's Moby Dick had a lot of whale in it. <laughs> the, the fact of the unresolved ending is, is almost the whole point of the novel. It's the only thing that was on the author's mind when she was writing it. It's the only thing she ever talked about afterwards. It's the only thing anyone else ever talked about afterwards. So, I don't know. I don't know that, that the ending of Picnic at Hanging Rock counts as being anticlimactic. 
I think it's the I think it's the point of the book. Uh, but I could be wrong about that. I, I reread it when Penguin came out with a classic of it a few years ago, but I have not read it since. Um, and it is beguiling. I could e it could easily stand another reread. Uh, but for me, the answer to this question of, of a book that is anticlimactic that an that fizzles out at the end is I, I cannot specify. I, you have seen that a million times on this channel. Virtually everything that I read in terms of contemporary fiction. People who write contemporary novels, especially so-called literary fiction, don't ever have any idea how to end their stories. They they just write until their bed at Yaddo is withdrawn, and then they stop. And uh, without any sense of dramatic closure, without any sense of, of uh, you know, a climax or a denouement or any kind of satisfying payoff at all, that sort of stuff is left for uh, non-literary, for sort of crowd pleaser fiction as one writer of literary fiction told me and referred to it that way crowd pleasing fiction with a big wince of distaste on her face that yeah well no i don't want a novel that wraps things up in neat little bows okay yeah that's great so what she was saying all those years ago was that she was intentionally uh blundering intentionally leaving her novels with unsatisfying endings and absolutely refused to admit that the reason was because she just got bored or wrote to her word count and the minute she got to it she stopped the book anything other than that she wouldn't admit any of that instead it had to be artistic and not only artistic but artistic on a wavelength that i poor mutt that i am can't really understand <laughs> That's, uh, I, I i wanted to say to her i of course did not we were on her home turf and not mine i wanted to say to her that your job is to be crowd pleasing and the minute you look on that with withering disdain, you're a joke. You are the punchline of a joke, whether you realize it or not. Uh, but I didn't say any of that, because I'm so nice. <laughs> and that is it. That is the uh, alphabet soup tag. A is for author. The only other prompt is to tag. It was a, a tag swack. <laughs> and in, at this point, Sean mentioned... Uh, the earlier in his video, at the beginning of his video, he mentions that he wants to get away, he wants to get booktube tags away from what he calls the childish practice of tagging specific people. He wants to just throw tags out into the wilderness, and anybody who wants to do them can do them. You don't have to wait to be tagged. On one level, this is good for me, because nobody ever tags me, because they hate me, because I smell. Uh, but on the other hand, it's almost like Sean isn't aware of the fact that of the main function of the tagging in a tag, which is to... Uh, mark out who your cool kid friends are and who your frenemies are. If, I, if we're not tagging people, how are we going to do that? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to adhere to his wishes, so I'm not going to tag anybody. That is my a is my alphabet soup book tag, and if you want to do it, you should, because uh, these are great prompts, and I'm looking forward to the next one. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.